So as we mentioned before, macrophages are present in the connective tissue um, as the second line of defence. We went into that they engulf neutrophils and clean up the area, but we didn't mention what cytokines they secrete. Macrophages release a series of cytokines that include TNFA, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, and PGE2. All of these alter fibroblast activity and promote fibroblasts to release MMPs. These MMPs break down the collagen matrix, as we spoke about in the last video. At the same time that MMPs are being released, PGE2 directly leads to bone resorption. Bone resorption occurs by the PGE2 stimulating macrophages in bone to turn into osteoclasts. As you probably remember from before, osteoclasts are the cells responsible for breaking down bone. PGE2 also stimulate osteoblasts to secrete rank L, which directly relates to bone resorption also. Now osteoblasts are responsible for building bone. They are the op do the opposite of what osteoclasts do. However, when they secrete rank L, they contribute to bone resorption. And we will explain how this happens soon. So you've come to the first pause, and in this video there'll be a number of pauses where you can reflect on what you've just learned and create your own flowcharts, or even list some steps, before you progress onto the next section. At the same time, T and B lymphocytes also dominate the underlying connective tissue. The T lymphocytes, with the help of macrophages, release pro-inflammatory cytokines and rank L for bone resorption. while the B cells produce high amounts of antibodies, such as IgE2, which clump bacteria together and work with the complement system to destroy bacteria. Now we will explain the Rankel pathway. Rankel is a protein expressed by osteoblasts and T cells, which interact with the rank receptor coming off of osteoclasts. OPG is another protein secreted by osteoblasts and epithelial cells, which work to inhibit rank L. This is the normal process for regulating bone resorption. However, if there is an increased influx of rank L expressed by T cells and by osteoblasts, it overwhelms the OPG and it causes increased osteoclast activity, which leads to bone loss. So just summarising the bone remodelling process, I'm going to draw a scale over here. If there is more OPG being expressed by those osteoblasts and less rank L, this reduces osteoclast activity. However, if there is more rank L and less OPG, this increases osteoclast activity, which in turn leads to bone resorption. Ideally, when OPG and rank L both balance each other out, so we have OPG and rank. So they're balanced. 
this means that there's normal bone remodelling happening, and this is ideally what we want in the periodontium. We're going to talk about the difference between gingivitis and periodontitis and how you can differentiate between the two. So in gingivitis, the junctional epithelium becomes laterally displaced and there is pseudo-pocketing, but there is no attachment loss. So in periodontitis, the inflammatory response moves deeper into the tissues. So in perio, uh, due to bone resorption, there is also connective tissue attachment loss, and this means a breakdown of fibres such as transeptal fibres, which reform at a more apical level. This equals a migra migration of the junctional epithelium to follow the alveolar crest, um, which maintains the biological width. Clinically, this is seen as pocket formation, and in gingivitis, we don't get the breakdown of connective tissue, um, or the attachment loss, uh, but in perio we do. So long story short, it is not every case of gingivitis that will progress into periodontitis um, because biofilm and plaque, although they do contribute um, to perio, they are not the cause. It is the variety of different host factors and I'll draw them up for you now. So the expression of periodontitis is due to the maturity and amount of plaque biofilm present, um, also the host response, the predisposing factors, modifying factors, and the host's ability to repair itself. So some people will have high amounts of biofilm present and a regulated host response, whereas other people will have minor forms of biofilm present uh, but an exaggerated host response, and those people are more susceptible to developing those more um, advanced forms of periodontitis. So this is just another way to show the balance of cells in a healthy periodontium and an unhealthy um, case such as periodontitis. So in a healthy periodontium, there is more TIMP present and anti-inflammatory cytokines and the balance is heavier. So that is why we get that healthy expression of the tissues. And in an unhealthy case such as periodontitis, we've got more pro-inflammatory cytokines such as PGE2s, um, interleukin-1 and MMPs. So after your second video, you were asked by Sophie to create a concept map or write a list of steps on the pathogenesis of gingivitis. Now we'd like you to add all of this material that you've learnt today onto your concept maps and bring it to class.